So how many people are going to be here? Like I thought we have five, right? We are, yeah, actually we are just started getting started now and we are waiting for one more person, but I think we are going to go ahead and just get started and hopefully Zhao will um, join us momentarily. Um, so first I have to say welcome everyone to our panel on startups during COVID responses, strategies, and results. My name is Kirsten Birkin. I'm a program fellow at Extreme Tech Challenge, the world's largest startup competition and community for purpose-driven companies. Our mission is to empower entrepreneurs building innovative technologies that improve the world. Our goal is to identify potential market-leading companies that can impact the world in a big way and provide the rocket fuel to help them scale faster. Every year, we attract thousands of applications from around 100 countries. So today, we have about 45 minutes for our discussion, which will focus on the following. Economic crisis are usually periods where new ideas and ways of doing business come to the fore. Not surprisingly, the COVID crisis has been leading to a startup boom. How do we navigate the pandemic and how can startups accelerate post-COVID recovery? I'm really excited to talk with our panel members today on their experiences from the last two years and hear their thoughts on what lies ahead. So I'd like to invite each panelist to give about two minute introduction of him or herself, and then we will dive into today's topic. So Minesh, would you mind going ahead and starting? Sure. Hi, Kirsten. Thank you for having me. Uh, so I'm a startup founder. Uh, first time startup founder for 20 years uh, in the corporate world. Sold our previous company to Blackstone and exited. Did not know that we were going to be facing COVID the first month that we started. We officially started on 1st of January, 2022. And we were hit head on by COVID, pivoted multiple times. Uh, today, about two years and two months later, we had about 30 people. We are completely um, bootstrapped. The business is growing, and uh, we we have done about $20 million in revenue in those, in those two years. Uh, we are profitable. We are cash flow positive, uh, and technology has all been built already. We're going to get into the next phase of growth with some fundraising in the next uh, two to three months. I'm really excited about uh, being here. Cool. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Svetlana? Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Svetlana Kamashanskaya. I'm a corporate lawyer and startup advisor in Silicon Valley. I'm based in Silicon Valley. So I <clears throat> do work closely with technology companies and we uh, provide services to companies that are starting and growing business in, in, in the U.S., as well as foreign companies coming to the U.S. So a good part of our practice is uh, foreign assisting foreign companies, foreign startups that already have product developed, let's say, in Europe. And um, they usually have some financing from European countries or European investors. And they come to the U.S. to accomplish like different goals. Sometimes it's just market. Sometimes they move headquarters to the U.S. Uh, with a plan to expand globally as a U.S.-based company. And, uh, of course, like access to investors is one of the considerations that companies have. Uh, so that's, that's my practice in a nutshell. And um, I'm always excited to work with technology companies because I think it's the most rewarding legal work that you can possibly do uh, because you're building something. You're part of the building team versus litigating or fighting for something. So although it's sometimes that happens even with startups, but I really enjoy what I'm, what I'm doing. That's amazing. Thank you both so much. Um, we were supposed to have, again, uh, two more people joining us. Hopefully they will ju jump in um, sometime soon. However, I think we should just get started on our first topic and dive in. So the first question I wanted to go over with everyone was, COVID was a rapid dis disruption of everything, as we all know. In about two minutes, maybe, um, I'd like for each of you to tell a brief story of how you as entrepreneurs or as professionals pivoted your business or business strategy at the onset of COVID. What changes did you make? Uh, sure. sure, I can go for that one. Yeah, um, jump in. So, so initially when we started the company, the company was started with the objective of providing uh, sourcing experts that would go to trade shows on the behalf of people that would attend trade shows. And obviously trade shows did not happen. 
uh, conferences, trade shows, everything was cancelled. And we would have a network of these people that would be attending these shows. And that's what the business was built on. All of the business was built on. Uh, so as soon as we saw that uh, COVID was going to cancel the trade shows and we were going to face these issues, we immediately uh, launched a service which would be non-dependent on trade shows but the sourcing professionals can work freelance no matter uh, show or no show. And they would be able to help buyers find products and suppliers without the help of uh, any trade show or conference happening. So that was the first pivot we did. After that, we pivoted in terms of product categories and launching product categories such as PPEs, which were in demand at that point of time. Uh, we pivoted into helping uh, uh, hospital products, we help uh, procure medical devices and everything that was there during that point of time. And that was very quick pivots because we did not understand the space at all. And we had to hire people to get people on the board and do it all. So it's, it's been multiple pivots that we had to make as the market needed us to do. Interesting. Thank you. Thanks. And Svetlana, what about your business? I, I can talk about my business really like briefly because most likely our audiences are at startups versus law firms. <laughs> and I, I want to talk more about my clients and I can see their differences that were pivots or changes that they try to implement. And I think that's more interesting. So definitely we all became virtual, right? And I work, as I mentioned, with international companies as well as US-based companies. And one of the critical... Uh, component of the company's success is the team. So we all knew that before and we know that now, but uh, before uh, COVID started, uh, typically I would say to my clients, you know, if you want to go and raise capital in, in, in the US, in Silicon Valley, the company has to be like have physical presence here. We have to have team here. We have to have at least management in the US, right? So we can go and present. That's one of the major changes that I observed over last uh, two years. So I don't know, I, I lost the track two and a half years of COVID. <laughs> so definitely it's not that critical to first be present right now at the place where investors are. Second, I think uh, the global market, we, we have a global market of uh, talent right now, right? So people became more flexible in terms of hiring people from different jurisdictions. We all get to use to Zoom or different platforms that allows us to uh, allow us to be efficient and collaborative over like over the ocean, over like from different continents. Mm -hmm. And that's what we like we utilize. I started to utilize. I had paralegal uh, until recently from India and definitely my clients um, started to do the same. And talking about paralegal, that was an interesting story. In fact, like Indian court, courts were closed for more than a year. Yeah. And uh, lawyers in India didn't have work. So some entrepreneurs started schools for paralegal training Indian lawyers to become paralegal for the US-based like law firms. Oh, wow. And so that's how we got the Indian paralegals. So definitely there were changes across the different industries and the legal industry was affected probably the, the, the least, but nevertheless, we, we observed the changes. Interesting. Well, th that actually really um, like goes right into our next question that we were going to discuss, which is what changes do you think are going to be permanent versus temporary um, regarding remote work and employee employer relationships? Like where do you see trends kind of sticking and, and changing? I think we, we employees, as I mentioned before, uh, became more flexible in terms of moving, in terms of employers are more flexible in terms of hiring people from abroad. And, um, you know, we I think COVID taught us that there's nothing like permanent and we have to be flexible. And I'm sure everyone is aware of what is going on these days in Russia and Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And I can see that um, people are more resilient. So the the experience that people had dealing with crisis two years ago, they try to kind of use the tools and knowledge that they have to deal with new crisis. So I think resilience 
is one of the acquisitions that we have as a result of COVID. Mm -hmm. And that, that is going to stay with us, I think. Manesh, what do you think is kind of temp temporary versus permanent of the changes you've seen? You're still on mute. So just like uh, what we discussed just now, um, I mean, well, one of the things that we depend on or what we started our company on was uh, based on the fact of remote working. Now, the remote working is accepted. It's uh, something that we will live with. And that's a change that's going to be coming uh, uh, in, in terms of something that we will uh, kind of make it part of our lives. Because in the past, when we were told not to go to work or they would work remotely, there was always those questions about inefficiencies and stuff. And then people have quickly realized that there is no inefficiency in working remotely. So that is part one. The other is the retail. So I, I work in the retail space mm -hmm. and the global retail world has changed rapidly. Um, so if you see in the last two, three years, the growth of the e-commerce platforms around the world uh, whether it was uh, uh, whether it was platforms uh, such as Shopify or Magento or Amazon and eBay, all of them have grown rapidly, and they will continue to grow. The growth, if you see the trajectory, that growth is coming from these uh, sites, and that trajectory is going to happen, uh, and that's a permanent change. Also, we are moving towards that direction where retail will be from those third-party sellers. Uh, something else that will change is the travel. Mm -hmm. The amount of business travel to conferences and events uh, and trade shows, et cetera, that we used to all do, I think it's going to reduce. C CFOs are not going to give back the same amount of budgets that we all had in 2019. So that's going to be a big permanent change as well. So, thank you so much. Jiao, welcome. I'm so happy you were able to jump in. Um, thank you. So sorry. It was my bad because I had the wrong browser and then uh, my computer is just too old for this, technical. but made it, made it. Thank you so much for your patience. <laughs> technical difficulties as part of the game. Um, quickly, do you think maybe you could do give us a quick background uh, introduction of yourself and then maybe you can jump in on some, some of the topics that we've, we've just started on? Sure, absolutely. So uh, my name is Jean Bavos. I'm the founder and CEO of Venia. Uh, in a previous life, I was a professor of electrical and computer engineering, so I've been working on wireless networks for about 20 years and basically connecting cars, uh, buses, trucks, anything that moves to each other into the internet. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, this session spoke to me because the last two years have been quite an incredible journey, and so I look forward to sharing but also learning from, from all of you. Thank you so much. So we were actually just uh, discussing a little bit about how everyone kind of uh, uh, pivoted during the beginning of COVID. Could you speak briefly about how maybe your company pivoted when COVID really hit? Well, to give you an idea, our main customers uh, before COVID were auto OEMs. Uh, so you can imagine uh, what it meant for us when mobility just stopped and uh, <laughs> automakers didn't know whether they were going to sell uh, any cars uh, until the end of the year. So some of the most catastrophic projections were like 40, 50 percent uh, uh, reductions in, in sales. Um, in the end, it ended up being 13, 14 percent. But uh, many of the auto EMs essentially froze their R&D budgets. Uh, and so anything that was planned to happen next year uh, continued because they had already made huge investments. But our projects were intending to bring software to connected vehicles in 2023 uh, through 2025. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, companies and startups uh, uh, die essentially because they run out of money. Uh, and they run out of money either because they don't have a business or because their investors lose uh, faith in them. And so the, the first thing we did was to basically do the math. Uh, look at our cash runway and figure out, you know, how long all our revenues and projects and so on just uh, don't happen this year. Uh, and we looked and we had about 12 months and we realized we need at least 25, 10, 24 months to survive this. So I talked with, you know, as many people with gray hair as I could that had gone through multiple crisis before just to figure out and everybody was telling me 24 months at least 24 months 24 months um and so we had to do a very very painful restructuring 
Um, but the beauty and the silver lining of it was that uh, the team that uh, stayed of about 40 people became very, very cohesive. And back in startup mode, we were able to figure out that uh, there were millions of uh, dash cams and onboard units for fleets of deliveries that were having huge growth and uh, were putting more and more technology into their vehicles. Uh, and so fast forward uh, two years and we have a flourishing business of managing the data flows for telematics companies. And in the meantime, the auto OEMs came back. Um, so there was a silver lining to it, but it was extremely painful, especially for the people who lost their jobs uh, and just being, uh, you know, you know uh, uh, at, at the forefront of trying to figure out what do we do to our business? How do we keep our team together? And obviously all of the multiple lockdowns and so on that came didn't make anything easier. So it was very, very hard, um, but it required a lot of uh, communication. I think the, probably the number one thing I would, I think we did well in this period was that we had two daily huddles of the management team, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, uh, three all hands per week, Monday, Wednesday, uh, Friday, and just going through all the motions as uh, together as, as frequently as we could. So I think, you know, what I'm hearing that communication was a really big part of that. Um, and what we were at just discussing when you joined was, you know, what's going to be permanent and what's temporary? What were the changes that just, you know, were only for COVID and what's going to really stick with us as businesses move forward post, uh, you know, COVID? So some of the things, of course, that we were mentioning was travel or conferences, um, but some other things is remote work. So what do you see as you know, being something that's temporary versus uh, permanent for your company? So I think it might be too early to say any definitive things, definitive things about that because I think people are so very traumatized from the uh, whole uh, experience. And so I think people are still reacting out of you know, the fear and the, they, they felt, even, even if people feel more secure today. I do think that uh, for our team, uh, there's no doubt that uh, uh, working from home uh, is, is, is here to stay. More than half of our team has small children, uh, and uh, everybody asks for flexibility, convenience, and so on. On the other hand, uh, the team has been so productive that I, as a leader, don't have arguments to push for more community, which is what I crave for also personally, um, in that I think the lot, a lot is being lost right now. Uh, from in a human terms, um, and I'm not not ta talking necessarily business terms, but just you know feeling like you belong to a community rather than you're just doing a job. Um, it's not impossible to do with Zoom and remote w working, but it requires uh, so much planning and so much discipline. But right now, what I think is here to say is that people are only coming to the office when there's a very compelling reason, a program for them to come. They won't come just to work very few. On the other hand, we're also seeing that uh, there's a lot more depression and a lot more mental illness, just anecdotally. We're seeing that, but I think the studies and statistics uh, are starting to show that as well. So it may very well be, you know, that a year from now we're gonna say, yeah, this whole, you know, remote work, work from home was nice for a period of time, but we're really glad that we can go back to the office like three times a, a week. So I, I'm not putting that out of the question. Business wise, it's changed completely. So I, I was listening in as I as I come in, and what what Minesh was saying uh, uh, for us, business to business, enterprise, um, even fundraising uh, and relationships with investors we've never seen. Um, it's 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 for the first time. It's really possible to uh, do transactions without ever you know visiting other people's offices uh, in our industry. That's really really strange. Um, on the other hand, when you do travel, you have a competitive advantage um, and people do appreciate that. So also that I think it will not go back, I think, to the extensive, maybe even excessive um, business travel that we had before. But for, uh, more is getting done over video conferencing and asynchronously than we did before also on the sales side and customer support. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, so Svetlana, do you, have you seen some of these permanent changes with your all of the various you know companies that you're working for? Have you seen these themes that of mental health or of globalization that Zhao just brought up? 
you know, mental health is definitely going to be an issue. Like, uh, but I, I observe that different countries approach the COVID stage in a different way, right? So some countries ignored or like stayed in a lockdown for two months and it was over. So it really depends on the country in the first place. But in terms of traveling, I think I, I, I can agree with the previous speakers. Definitely, we're not going to travel that, that much for business. But on another end, I had worked, like I worked at the office yesterday with the whole team together. And I left office. I didn't do that much as I would do, like staying at home. But I felt like so satisfied that I had my team. We worked together. We spoke. We laughed. We had lunch together. So definitely is a different dynamic. And although we are more efficient at home, there's no doubt about that. But sometimes we we are still social creatures and we need people. So I think eventually we would find the balance. Uh-huh. And it's going to be more of like a combined uh, working arrangement versus just working from home. So you're seeing more of like a balance in the future. Yeah. yeah. Manesh, have you seen similar things with your team? Yeah, you know, I mean, I've seen... Uh, ba- balance is very relative, right? I mean, personally, I feel that my team is far more, uh, far more uh, capable and being able to be much more uh, productive during the pandemic. And we started during the pandemic, started organizing pretty much in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, all of the 30 people, 27 were all hired during the pandemic. So it was with the expectation that we'll be working remotely and the efficiencies will be checked. Uh, there are tools that have developed uh, from Slack to Teams and so many others that we use for really being productive and working on, working with each other on Teams. That's, I think, is something that we will continue. Um, as far as the community feeling goes, I think it's if the organization has been working in a certain way before, as it might be a challenge because they want that community feeling. For us as new organizations, I don't feel that as a challenge because we're just used to working this way. The advantage I see there is that, say for example, in my team, I've hired a tech team in India. I've hired coders in Pakistan. I've hired a UX guy in Czech, Czech Republic. I have coders in Siberia. And uh, I have a business analyst in Singapore. I have a business... Uh, uh, intelligence person in Taiwan, and I'm just basically hired based on the skill set rather than seeing where the location, skill set, and affordability, obviously. So it's been giving me that flexibility. And as a startup founder, I love that flexibility. I wouldn't be able to do that in the past environment. And Minesh, let me ask you so, how do you build a company culture uh, like that? And does it matter, or do you even try to build a company culture? Yes. No. So, one of the first things we did, Joe, you know, uh, and this was even before we registered the company, is we set the company with uh, seven values uh, of the company. The values are things that we believe in. So some of the values are uh, we are honest and we have integrity. Uh, we are team players. We are not Debbie Downers and stuff like that. So there are seven values that we created. And every single individual is measured on those values not just the KPIs. The KPIs and the performance and the sales numbers, all those things, fine, they, they work. But we want people to have these values. If they have these values and we measure them on those values, it continues to kind of build on the organization and build the culture of the organization. So, so you think that works equally well remotely as, uh, as in an yeah. office? Yeah. So I, I have my I have I have my doubts. <laughs> but, <laughs> Joe, we didn't have a choice, right? We didn't have a choice. Right. Right? We we started during the pandemic. Uh, you missed that, okay. but basically, I started the company first of January 2020. So you can imagine, we, every person that was hired was during that. So we had to think of it that we didn't have a choice of any other way. Understood. No, that's fair. You know, as they say, uh, necessity is the mother of invention. That's what happened. So, Manish, if I'm understanding correctly, part of like everyone's the way that they are, uh, you know, evaluated is part of being sticking to those seven values that you laid out. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. So their performance assessment, which we do every six months, is based on those. Every other meeting that we have, 
we actually evaluate on those seven criteria and these are qualitative in nature right they're not the measurement yeah. so that's that's what works for us and that's what we we had to do because we didn't have a choice yeah. i i think one thing for sure that i think happened during covid for us was that everything became much more intentional because there were when you don't have serendipity anymore when people don't meet in the office and things just happen spontaneously you have to you know plan uh and, and be intentional about uh, you, you know what projects do you do how do you share information asynchronously among people how do you ensure in huddles and so on that people continue to work as a team and stay connected and uh and in that way i think what i would love would be to actually uh go back to more time in the office but keep the same intentionality that we had before um i think what is missing really is uh, the you know the coffee breaks uh and the lunches together and so i uh most of our team is in porto portugal so we have a very latin you know restaurant and cafe culture um and uh, we also have colleagues in the us and germany and japan but uh but that and, and and they used to come on a regular basis to the engineering office in portugal so all of that i think just made it more fun is like i i think work is less fun when it's all about just doing tasks and just having very operational calls one after the other to get stuff done it's like for me it it loses the you know uh creative uh, uh clash of of ideas that you had when you have when you were together at, in 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 full 3D yeah no no joe i i completely agree and what i do for my team is that every friday at 3 pm uh shanghai tang when i live most of the time i will do a happy hour and i will pull out my bottle of whiskey or beer or whatever I'm drinking and then we i make sure that everybody is drinking something whatever they're drinking whether even if it's tea or coffee and then we just chit chat and discuss about what happened during the week and stuff like non work stuff so we I, I, yeah no no that totally makes sense i think the other thing that occurred to me that i think is going to stay is that i think in in general and and i'm i'm uh i i hope i i won't uh you know sound immodest but just in general i think this whole generation of leaders that had to go through this experience together and just look after their teams think much more about the well-being also mental well-being of their teams are i i see a whole range of much more humane company leaders and business people than i saw before um and so i think that in a way there's a silver lining to that i think people are or or leaders in general are more aware i think of the needs of their teams on the other hand in the tech sector as a leader you have zero leverage because every single technical employee now has five job officer yeah. offers yeah. waiting for them on That's the linkedin everyone is so humane right so because you you have no choice but i think the power is all on the side of the employees right now uh completely and and that's a, an issue because i think the, all the things that uh uh minesh was describing on how to build a culture and so on requires rules and requires some form of accountability so someone has to look after this garden um and obviously it's not the ceo alone there's has to be a whole thing but you have to have a critical mass of people that care about that enough to demand accountability from others um and when you know everybody is thinking oh i can just jump to another job whenever i want um it's a harder thing to do i think no joe the the one thing we did was as part of our hiring as well we used to discuss these values and we used to see people's reactions on these values and we have kind of uh, not hired people that felt like these are not their values or that felt like not, not directly saying it but you can read between the lines and they react to those so uh, i think we we have been very uh, we would have never i would have never done this in my previous role right i worked for an asset management company with 5000 people and we never think thought about all these values we only thought about oh what was your performance at that place how much revenue did you bring or what did what else story did you bring into the table and those kind of things and we just change our complete tone because you know okay we know from your resume what you've done we will verify that but more importantly let's see if you fit into the kind of the mold of the company and and job the 30 people that i've hired i've not had to fire even one person yet or none of them have left Mm-hmm. really impressive um 
I love all that that you guys are bringing up. We actually discussed, we had done our practice. We had talked a little bit about COVID's impact on problem solving for fundamental societal problems, such as climate change and social inequalities. We're talking a little bit here already about mental health and how that's, you know, the changes that that brings. But what other things do you see as changes that are coming with that, with these changes that are culturally changed all of us? Have you seen any other societal changes in terms of the way people are interacting with one another or climate change? Maybe we talked about traveling. I'll, I'll let Svetlana go first this time. <laughs> yeah, sure. So first of all, like all my clients are tech companies, like innovative companies, right? And um, a lot of people try to make an impact. So it's not just about making money. It's about making difference. And therefore, I see a lot of companies that are focused on uh, green technologies or like global warming. I have uh, the trend of combination of nonprofit and for profit working together to make an impact and at the same time develop the technology. <laughs> the, the change that I can see is that COVID gave us a chance to think about what we really want to do. And it's like, a, we all know about the great resignation. So a lot of people left the companies or work that they were not interested in and started uh, companies or doing something that they want to enjoy and bring the difference to the world. So from that perspective, I think it was just a chance for us to reassess think is it something that we're doing is important for the society and if we have power and energy of changing that that's what we have to pursue and I can see that that's what is happening at least in the US yeah absolutely I see that happening in Europe uh, um, very much as well that, that the people had a time of introspection and uh, you know a lot of time to meditate and uh, and realize you know why why am i doing this job uh, and uh, and so in a highly competitive job market actually i do th think that companies that uh, you know are not just building successful businesses but actually also solving problems like how to address climate change so in our case is how to use data and connectivity to make mobility more sustainable and more efficient for 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 everyone so, so, and so, so basically all, all, when you have that, an ideal where your technology is actually serving um, society and mankind in some way, uh, I think that that appeals a lot uh, to technologists that have many different, and non-technologists that have many options right now in terms of their careers. Yeah. No, I, I have to agree there. I mean, if, if our solution is not going to solve problems, and it's just something, oh, I want to um, create something because I want to make money from it, most of the times we will uh, run out of people who believe in us or who, are, who follow uh, follow our steps. And, uh, you know, like the organizations have become so flat, we have to be completely transparent with everybody. So if there was any gap there or if you're not really solving issues, it would be so easy to lose those people. Um, and I think that that for successful startups or su successful companies during this time, the people that have stuck around, they either stick around for the reason that they cannot, they're, they're so incapable that they cannot find any jobs anywhere else. But most of the times it's because they believe in the founder, they believe in what the founder is trying to do or what solutions the company is solving, etc., etc. Unless it, without that, there is no reason or no motivation for anybody to stick around. On the other hand, I don't think venture capital is doing that yet. So let me say something more polemic, is that when you look at where venture capital is going in many cases, um, I, I really ask myself, you know, uh, for many of these things, and I'm not going to go crypto bashing here or anything, <laughs> but, but it's like, I, I just, uh, I wonder, you know, uh, how much better we would be if uh, you know billions and billions of dollars would go into renewable energy rethinking you know our, our no. water water i mean my country is going to run out of water in the next couple of decades and nobody's addressing that yet so so just to give an example 
Sorry, no, no, I have to. to... Oh, okay, are you Manish? You got, I got what he said, yeah? Yeah, yeah, I got most of what he said, yeah. but I did lose him for a little bit. But his point about the VCs is completely correct. I mean, the investors are crowding around crypto and blockchain and all these things. But uh, I mean, frankly speaking, uh, NFTs now, there's so much of these NFTs. We are not solving any problems. NFTs or crypto are not solving any problems. Uh, there are so many other bigger problems to solve, whether it is climate related or uh, uh, sexual equality related and so many other stuff. And unless until we solve those problems, we are not going to be uh, having a society that we want to live in or like to live in. So that's something that we need to think about. And as a, as investors, they need to think about where they're investing and they're putting the money into. And democracy. I would add democracy to that. So <laughs> let's go. Pain point these days, right? Uh, I, I want to say that like, I, I cannot completely agree uh, with that because, as I mentioned, there is a trend when companies try to solve the problem and at the same time open a non-profit organization to kind of complement. And one of the reasons why, from the legal perspective, we open non-profit is because a lot of charitable organizations are willing to invest in non-profits. So it's, in a way, it's not a venture capital. But this is money that could be invested into development of technology and the resolution of the problem just through different different vehicles. I think we don't have enough of um, developed enough legislature in that respect because, as you know, like Delaware tried to implement that um, benefit company, public benefit company, as a forum to kind of control the uh, development of business at the same time to benefit the society by transparency, but it didn't work really. Uh, but I think it's something like in the future that is coming. We don't have enough uh, of legal ground to promote the investments into problem solving startups more than money making. Well, I can't help but wonder, you mentioned, you know, the, the great resignation, and maybe that's something as entrepreneurs that should be important for, maybe for startups coming up, that if they have the transparency and they give uh, employees a sense of doing good, that that'll make a difference in where they stay and where companies they gravitate towards. Men that's men true. Culture, right? And culture in the company is definitely part of that. And uh, we know, like in Silicon Valley, we have a lot of um, headquarters of huge corporations, and we... we we know their reputation. So some big companies, quite successful, have a reputation of very toxic employer. And people leave the, the corporations regardless of the position they have at that company. So, yes, definitely. That, that is a big contributor to the decision-making process. So I think that brings us to one of our final questions of, the, e of the, the day, which is, you know, what will determine success in the future for startups moving forward? I think, I mean, it's not changing completely, right? I mean, of course, success will still be connected with the with the growth of the organization, the financial uh, KPIs that every organization has. That's not going to go away. That's going to stay. But as we discussed earlier, there are going to be uh, uh, qualitative aspects that are going to be more important as to what is the problem we're solving? What is the... Uh, volume of the problem that we are able to solve and what is the scale of the impact. You know, we all talk about impact these days. So what is the impact our organization has on whichever industry we are in or whichever sector we are active in? So that's going to be something that we need to look forward to and measure that impact of our own companies. Uh, and I think that's one change that is coming rapidly. It is already happening. The COVID has been a catalyst to make that impact. Uh, be more even more important measuring of the impact more. Yeah, I agree that the fundamentals I think uh, uh, are are still in my mind: uh, uh, resilience, uh, creativity, uh, and communication. So I think people have to endure all sorts of uh, pains and no's and. Uh, uh, um, sweat <laughs> and tears. Uh, so, so that's the resilience part. And I think uh, uh, COVID really was a test. I think our executive team, um, you know, grew together in a way that would not have happened, I think, in a, in a more normal situation. 
uh, on the creativity side is that, you know, you imagine the world as it could be, but you have to also build a successful business in the world that is, and basically takes the world that is to the world that could be. And that's an exercise of imagination. And that I think is where the biggest deficit might be uh, after everything that happened in the last two years um, uh, right now. And then it's, you have to communicate that uh, in many different ways because the, the way you tell your story to the investors is not the same as you, uh, your customers, as your, your team, as your family, as your wife. So <laughs> all of those. <laughs> and, and, and so I think those fundamentals are, um, are still very much, uh, very, very much the same. Uh, I, I do think that, uh, uh, you know, the practical day to day then is changing, but we already talked a lot about that, uh, but I would say the fundamentals are still the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the question was about, about the success of the startup, right? So how do we measure the success? I think... What will determine success in the future? Yeah, the yeah I think success, like <laughs> the definition of success is different from every startup founder and I think the most like one of the component is to keep the values when startup founders start the company like and we discussed that today right so the, the founders have like Minesh mentioned have values in mind and I think the success of the company is uh, the ability to maintain and develop those values and kind of grow and uh, still still keep in mind what the important things are uh, that's one of the parts of the success. And of course, impact and financial results. <laughs> we cannot get away from that, right? So that's a success. So, yeah, that's pretty much it. Okay. Well, um, I want to say thank you to all of you guys. Um, this has been really a very insightful conversation. I appreciate your contributions to this discussion. Um, and more than that, for me, it was a pleasure to represent Extreme Tech Challenge today during this panel discussion and remind everyone that XTC is looking to partner with public and private entities to invest in tech innovations and build a better wor world. So if uh, anyone watching, if you're interested in collaborating, please reach out to me. Um, you can find me at Kirsten at ExtremeTechChallenge.org or find me on LinkedIn and find any of our panelists on LinkedIn as well. Thank you so much, everybody. I really appreciate your time today. Have a good Thanks afternoon. so much. Thank you for the excellent. Thank you, everyone. Thank Very you. good chatting with you. Bye. Have a great day. Bye.